Well, good morning, and thank you for joining us today here in Colorado Springs at the World Challenge Studio. And to those of you who are watching online or on our YouTube channel, thank you for joining us. Um, if you'll get your Bible out and turn with me to Romans chapter 10, today's sermon is titled, A Gospel for All. A Gospel for All. In Romans 10, starting in verse 5, it says, For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven? That is, to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Oh God, I, I just glorify you and magnify you, Lord, in this beautiful proclamation, Lord, that grafts a Gentile sinner like me into the family of God, Lord. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek, Lord, between uh, skin color, between socioeconomic background, between uh, geography of where you were born and raised, God. The Bible here says all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved, God. And so I want to thank you and praise you for that. Lord, I pray that today's sermon would be light unto someone's feet, Lord, and, and a lamp into their path, God, where they would, they would just see the glorious beauty of the gracious gift of the gospel that was made available for all who believe through the vicarious work of Christ on the cross. Lord, let us be drawn uh, by your spirit, Lord. Let us be uh, j just conformed to the image of Christ, God, as we, we rejoice in this beautiful text together. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. A gospel for all. This is the most important information in the history of the entire world. The God who created the world with the power of his word whom we were estranged from and damned because of our sin, has made a way for us to be reconciled to him. And he has invited us to be part of his eternal family. Now, the reason why this is often not great news to people is because they are sinners who are deceived and lost and blind. They don't really believe that, that God is too concerned about how they live their lives. So that's why it's so important to belabor the point that sin is damning and that God is God. This is the most amazing news in the history of the world for Jews and Gentiles alike. But, you know, just to be honest with you, this is the most amazing news of my life personally. Now, we're here to preach the scripture. And so I'm not trying to superimpose myself on this text. But I have to share with you that I am a sinner saved by the wonderful grace of God. This news is so good to me because I became aware that I was a wretched lost sinner. You know, I lived a great portion of my life as a, a rebel sinner who, who was entangled in all sorts of immorality and, and addiction and, and really just came to a point of desperation in my life. You know, I, I was an intravenous drug user. I've been incarcerated for, for many stints in my life. And it's because I, I lived to gratify the desires of my flesh. And I'm so thankful so thankful that God let 
uh, me deteriorate into a point where I was uh, aware, so aware of my hopelessness and my helplessness, and that I called upon his name for salvation. Now, here's the truth, though. It doesn't mean that because I was a drug addict, um, you know, that that definitely made me call out upon the Lord. There are many people who are drug addicts who, who want salvation from addiction, but don't want salvation from their sins. They don't want to bow their life, the knee of their life to a Savior who will lead them, who they will surrender their life to, who they will be a doulos to, which is the Greek word for slave. We are slaves to Christ, those of us who have recognized him as God. And so it's the same for the middle class person or the the upper class person or the well-educated person or the uneducated person. It takes a spiritual miracle for our eyes to be open to the need for salvation. But I'm convinced that those who truly see who God is, and who truly understand how grievous their sin is because the Spirit has opened our eyes to these things, there's only one real and right response. You see God as Lord. You see ourselves as wretched sinners who will be judged by Him one day. And then we see this hand of grace extended to us. This hand of grace saying, listen, I will forgive your sins. I will wash your your crimson, red, blood-stained, sinful heart as white as snow. Listen, if that that is the, the reality and the story of your life, you will be saved. A truly saved person is grateful and thankful. This is the best news in the history of the world. But like I said before, communicating to people that Jesus came to save sinners often isn't the hard part. The hard part is people believing that they are either too far gone for God to be able to want to save them or that they actually really need a savior. People often fall in one of two ditches. They think they're too bad that God would be willing to deliver them or they think they're they're too good to really need salvation all that much. Some might say, they're, the big deal is convincing people there is a God, but I, I honestly don't believe that is true because the Bible tells us that that is not true. The Bible tells us that deep down, everybody really knows that there's a God because nature has revealed it to us. And, and just the basic logic shows us that something created us in this world and the complex beauty of it. The reason why we we pretend like there isn't a God is we suppress righteousness for the sake of unrighteousness. We suppress the knowledge of God because we love sin and we love to be the lords of our own life. And I know you would think many people, wait a minute, they're really good people. They don't love sin. They, they They just don't believe there's a God. They haven't been convinced. You may think that's true. They may seem like really good people to you, but there's something in them that doesn't want to relinquish control of their life. Listen to what Romans 1.18 says. For the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and his divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man, birds and animals and creeping things. The Bible clearly tells us here that they knew God. You know there's a God. 
You, you, you fight against it. You, you press against it. You stumble against the stumbling stone. But we are foolish. We are obstinate. We are selfish. We are self-serving. Listen, we want to retain control of our lives. Deep down, we suppress the truth of God for the sake of our unrighteousness. And sometimes we think about people as being good in, in the sense of the, the, the external. We think of them being good because they do good works and they give to charity and they're, they're nice and they're friendly and they seem thoughtful and caring. But the truth is the greatest sin that we commit against God in our fallen sinful state is that we don't give God his due. No person in the history of the world has ever loved the Lord their God with all of their heart and with all of their soul and with all of their mind and with all of their strength for the entirety of their life. And as created beings, that is our proper service of worship to the God who created us. And because of this, we also don't love our neighbor as ourselves. And so this is unrighteousness. We suppress God's knowledge because we want to retain control of those things. Deep down, we suppress the truth of God for the sake of our unrighteousness because we love our sin and because we love the illusion that our life belongs to us and we can do with it as we please. Most people who do good things in the world feel good about themselves as if they're doing some sort of service to God. And the Bible says in Romans 12, chapter 1, that this is actually just basic service. Living our lives as a complete and utter living sacrifice unto God is just our basic proper worship. This is what we were created to do. We're not doing anything above and beyond. We're serving the purpose we were created to do. We actually believe that we own our own lives. We believe that our lives are ours and we can do with it as we please. And that's why we're angry when things don't work out the way we want them to or when we see things that we perceive as unjust towards us. Although the Jews of the first century seemed to reverence the holiness of God, listen to me, Actually, they did not. We know this is true for two reasons. One is they rejected the Lord Jesus, God in the flesh. But also, and, and, and probably more obvious from this text, because they believed that they could earn their righteousness through good works. They believed that they were capable of keeping the law. To actually believe this, you must have a very low view of God and a very high view of yourself. Now, oftentimes people would jump in and go, no, 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 the, the, the Jews had a very high view of God. Like they, they were like, that's why they're so legalistic. That is not true. They didn't have a high view of God because they believed that they could somehow walk out righteousness. Any honest, real person who actually sees the holiness of God realizes, like the prophet Isaiah, that he is a man of unclean lips living amongst people of unclean lips. There is no possible way to come into the presence and the knowledge of a holy God and not feel humbled and to see the, the sort of despicable nature of your imperfections as you stand in the light that is gazing on you, that is blind that is consuming, that is penetrating. Another reason for this too, though, is they had misinterpreted from the scripture that since they were ethnic Jews, that they would definitely be saved. And they also believed that the Gentiles were damned. So when they did try to, to bring a Gentile in, basically they would, they would try to make them live up to the law also. And Jesus himself said that you, you would go to great lengths. You would take a trip across the sea to, to gain a convert. But once you did, talking to the Jewish leaders, you actually make them twice a son of the devil as you are. 
because you're teaching them to have faith in themselves, that they can keep the law instead of the faith that comes through Christ, the faith that comes in trusting God. This theme is very prevalent in the Old Testament. Trusting God, having faith in the word of God, taking God at his word. So let's jump into the text here. In verse 5, it says, For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law. That person who does the commandments shall live by them. So let's look back at the first four verses of, of Romans 10 so we can kind of understand why he's saying this. Listen, the first uh, four verses of Romans 10 says this, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God is for them that they might be saved. So Paul wants to make sure that even though he's saying that not all the Jews will be saved, he wants them to know that his heart is that they would be saved. They can't be saved by the the righteousness that, that they perceived they were gaining by following the law of Moses, because you have to be deceived to think you're actually living up to it. But Paul wants to make sure in verse one of chapter 10 that they understand that he, he does want them to be saved though. Even though he's, the Gentiles are being brought in, he's saying, my heart is still for the Jews. Oh, the blind Jews, if only the veil would be removed from your eyes. And in verse 2, he says, for I bear them witness that they have zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. They have zeal for God, but not according to the true knowledge of God's word. Listen, there's many today in our church culture that have great zeal for God. And and there's people on both sides of the equation, people that are very legalistic, who have great zeal for God, but they don't have that zeal according to the knowledge of God's word. And I would say there's probably today many more on the opposite side of that spectrum who believe that they can live and, and do however they want because of grace. And, and they kind of form a, a Christ that, that conforms to their image. But they have great zeal for God. They would tell you how much they love Jesus. And they talk about Jesus in their Facebook post. And they're just, oh, Jesus, how I love you. But when you bring it back to the word, they are angry at you and call you some sort of judgmental legalist. And here's why. Because they have great zeal for a God of their own invention. But they don't have great zeal for the God of the Bible. They have zeal for God, but not according to true knowledge of God's word. And like I mentioned a second ago, some have legalistic views of God. Some have uh, lascivious or sort of free-spirited views of God. But unless the God you're following and the word you're trusting in is, is in the scripture, then your knowledge, yours, I mean, your zeal is in vain. Your zeal is in vain. That's why we see a lot of people today with a vague spiritualism. And I know that many of you probably have actually said this or maybe even agree with it because you don't understand the statement properly. But a lot of people like to say, you know, it's about a relationship, not about a religion. Wrong. You are wrong. It is definitely about a religion. And it's also about a relationship. It's about a God we have a relationship with, but we have a religion, a a doctrine, a... Listen, we have the very words of God that dictate the terms of that relationship. So thinking we can have some sort of relationship with God apart from his word is utterly foolish, blasphemous, and wicked. So he says in verse 1 and 2, Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God is for them that they may be saved. For I bear witness that they have zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Verse 3, For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Verse 4, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. What is he saying? Jesus said in in the Sermon on the Mount, I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. 
And this is saying Christ has fulfilled the law and he has conquered death. And listen, he has made it to where we are not subject to the righteous requirement of the law because he was righteous for us. He died for us. He justified us before God if in fact we believe upon his name. And that will be evidenced by a life that lives according to his word. Listen, there are many ways to not submit to God's righteousness. You can believe that your good deeds and your good works are earning you the right to stand before God, to have right standing with God, or you can ignore the righteousness of God altogether. You can find many religious expressions inside and even outside of Christianity that do not submit to God's righteousness, but there is only one way to be right with God. And it is through true belief and surrender to the gospel of Jesus Christ as revealed in the scripture. There are many, many ways that you can can ignore or you can uh, try to supersede the righteousness of God. See, that's what the Jews actually did. We don't think about it that way often, but they actually were ignoring or diminishing the righteousness of God. You have to, to think that you can live up to his righteous standard. The law is the character of God, and we are not like God. That's what the law was meant to show us. It was meant to produce deep dependence and, and, and gravitation towards the salvation of the Messiah. Now, Sometimes in legalism, we think, you know, that way, but on the other side, we don't think that way as much. But we, when we, when we say we're spiritual, but not religious, or it's a religion, not a religion, it's a relationship. And we, we try to kind of just push the Bible over to the side. What we're really doing is we're, we're doing the same thing the legalist does. We're ignoring the righteousness of God, the righteous decrees of God, the righteous character of God, and the fact that no one is righteous, no one is good, no, not one. This is the narrow road to salvation that is found in Christ alone. Only God could save us from God. See, when we talk about the wrath of God and the judgment for sinners, sometimes we we disconnect these two concepts. The person who is angry and wrathful and who will pour out judgment is God. So by saving us, God is literally saving us from himself. And he had to do it through the means of, of Christ because God's justice can not be unfulfilled. He is fully just, and his wrath must be satisfied. God is saving us from God. Only God can save us from God. Just like much of humanity humanity today, much of the Jewish leadership of the first century interpreted the Bible to suit themselves rather than to magnify and glorify God. Those looking for God, hear me always find him. Those who want to be right with God will humbly submit themselves to his will and his word. There aren't, there aren't a bunch of people out there looking for God who aren't finding him. Matthew 7 verse 7 says this, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. Listen, for everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, to them the door will be opened. Then he gives a little example. For which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If then you are evil and you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask? Ask, seek, knock. The problem is, is that humanity is not really seeking God. We might seek the things that God can afford us, but typically and mostly, mankind is not seeking God. The seekers who show up at your church 
typically are not seeking God. They're seeking something that their heart wants or a need they have. They come because their marriage is in trouble. They come because they want their kids to grow up with moral behavior. They come like I did because I had an addiction problem. They come because they're searching for something. Listen, everybody wants the benefits of knowing God. We all want peace and and, and we all want to feel loved and we all want to be provided for. We all want these things. But those who actually seek to know God and want to be right with God, those people will be satisfied. But Romans 3.10 tells us, as it is written, none is righteous. No, not even one. No one understands and no one seeks for God. All have turned aside together and have become worthless. No one does good. No, not even one. It is the work of the Spirit of God to convict us and to draw us towards God. The law of Moses and the Old Covenant and really everything in the history of the world is meant as a mere backdrop to magnify the glorious beauty of Jesus Christ. Everything in creation, the old covenant, history, the sky, the air circulating in and out of your lungs, life, death, up, down, black, white, everything is merely a backdrop to magnify the glory of the Son of God, God's only begotten, eternal begotten Son, Jesus, to magnify the glory of Christ, hallelujah. Verse 6, but the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith that we proclaim. The beauty of the gospel of Christ and the salvation that he affords those who put their faith in him and trust him, listen, who understand that without God himself drawing near to us, that we were hopeless, these are the people that will be saved. We didn't find Christ. He found us. We didn't didn't ascend to heaven to bring Christ down to our level. We didn't work our way to God somehow. Nor did we descend to the depths of the abyss to bring Christ up from the dead. We had nothing to do with him drawing near to us. We had nothing to do with him raising from the dead. We are merely benefactors if, in fact, we believe by faith that Christ's death was what is what's affording us eternal life, reconciliation with God. And because of this, we, we live lives of service to him. We are able to believe in our hearts. Listen, because of this, we are able to believe in our hearts and confess with our mouth faith that God drew near to us, that God laid down his life for us, and that God raised himself from the dead. The triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Yes, Jesus came and drew near. He took on flesh. He died. He rose again. But the Trinity was completely part of that as God the Father decreed this from the eons of history, as the Spirit of God raised Christ from the dead, as Christ in his love and obedience to the Father came, walked among us, lived a perfect life, laid his life down after being brutalized, and then rose from the dead. He drew near to us. God drew near to us. Man, think about that for a minute. The God of heaven drew near to us. This is the beauty of the gospel. But it's also very tragic and ironic because much like the Jews who rejected Christ in the first century, today in the West, we have churches on nearly every corner and 
unlimited access to the Bible. In fact, many people who would deny Christ probably have multiple copies of the Bible in their house, or at least did growing up. We have unlimited access to God. We are blessed, and this is so tragic. Because these very people reject the God who took on flesh, the God who drew near. They reject him as Savior, which means they accept him or take them or listen. If you reject him as Savior, you are taking him as judge. There is no third option. Christ will either be the judge of your life who judges you based on you or God will judge you based on the blood of Jesus that shields you and saves you and changes you. This is the word of faith that we proclaim. Jesus is Lord. Jesus came to save repentant sinners. Jesus is King. We are saved by faith. Not faith in our works, not faith in ourselves, not faith in our accomplishments, but by faith in the atonement Christ gave for us. He atoned. He paid the price. He drank the wrath of God from the cup of God's wrath. Christ secured for us on the cross and, and solidified by his resurrection that those who by faith attach themselves to the vine, or have been grafted by Christ, really better said, into the vine, those people have nothing to fear because they have life abundantly. They are part of the body of Christ. And like the author, Paul says, they will not be put to shame. <clears throat> so we get into verse 9. It says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So let's break this down. Our confession of faith is our pledge of allegiance to the Lordship of Christ. So often we hear about the confession of our mouth and it has completely been bastardized by the world today, by, by the modern American church and what I, uh, you know, so just despise, which is Christian decisionalism. This idea that if you say a prayer, these magic words somehow uh, make you right with God. We like to talk a lot about the confession of the mouth, but we really don't spend a lot of time talking about belief in the heart because that is where justification actually happens. The Lordship of Christ is what we are confessing. We are confessing that Jesus is Lord. And this will be evidenced by a life and a heart that follows him and obeys him. We are not doing works to be saved. We are doing works because we are saved. Our nature has changed. God has taken our, our broken, wicked heart and he has exchanged it for a new, regenerated heart with new passions and new desires. Listen, it doesn't mean you won't ever have temptation to sin because we're still in this old, wretched body of death. But we do have a different path, trajectory, desire, and that is to obey Jesus. Jesus himself said, you know who loves me? Those who keep my commands. The problem with, with the gospel today is it's no gospel at all. We don't present the gospel to people. We tell people after we preach a 30 or 40 minute man-centered sermon that if they would look into the camera and, and repeat this prayer, that now they're part of the family of God. I mean, people like Joe Olstein spend their whole sermon telling you how you can have what you want and you can do what you want and you can be rich and powerful and successful if you'll just speak it. And it's all about being the Lord of your own life and God is making this possible. And then he looks into the camera and says, and if you want to accept Jesus, just repeat these words. And people go, well, see, Joel, Joel talks about the gospel. Listen, if, 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 if you came to me and said, you can have all the things your wicked heart desires if you just say this prayer, I'd be like, well, sure, I'll take that, Jesus. 
This is not what Christianity is about. Christianity is about following Jesus, forsaking your life for the glory of God changing the path of your life. Matthew, I'm calling you. Leave your tax collector's booth and follow me. Peter, listen, leave your nets behind. Come and follow me. This has always been the pattern and it will always be the pattern because you can't have him as savior if you don't call him Lord. And this is about the heart. People are taught that they can have Christ as savior without having him as Lord. And you can't be a Christian and not follow Jesus. What do you think the word disciple means? It's about discipline. It's about learning the ways of the master, forsaking your way of life and taking up his way of life. So often people who don't really want to follow Jesus or submit themselves to his word say things like this. Yeah, yeah, I know about all the Bible stuff, but listen, God, God knows my heart. God knows my heart. I've had conversations with people that I was trying to evangelize many times and they would say, no, 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 yeah, sure, the Bible and all that, but God knows my heart. Or I'm living in this open, unrepentant, besetting sin, but God knows my heart. Hear me good. That is true. God does know your heart. And those words should terrify you. God knows your heart. He knows it better than you do. Most of us are so self-deceived about what's in our heart. That's why we go in and out of sin and don't have self-control. And we, and we find ourselves in all these wicked, perverse situations because we don't even know our own hearts. Listen, listen to what Jeremiah the prophet said in verse, uh, verse 9 of chapter 17. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? That's a rhetorical question. And the answer is not you and not me either. God knows our hearts. God knows. Listen, he knows everything inside of your heart and your mind. That's why he probably paralyzed some of the, the Jewish teachers of the law, when they were, they were congratulating themselves, and he said, listen, have you ever looked at a woman with lust? You are an adulterer. You ever been angry with your brother? You're a murderer. Jesus cares about the heart more, just as much as he does at the fruit at the end of the tree. He cares about the root and the fruit. And so many people today are interested in, in trimming trees and, and cultivating fruit. And being a Christian is about uprooting one tree and, and planting another. And this can only be done by God himself. We don't know our own hearts. Today, you often hear, you'll often hear people in non-biblical churches, man-pleasing, seeker-friendly type churches, that say things like, listen, follow your heart. God wants to give you the, the desires of your heart. There's no worse and godless advice that, that anyone could ever give you. Don't follow your heart. When it talks about God giving you the desires of your heart, it's talking about a regenerated heart, a heart that's focused on the kingdom of God and the will of God and the service of God because they're in service of a king they've abandoned their lives for. A true confession of faith in Christ is that's uttered from a regenerated heart whose eyes have been opened by the Spirit of God to the reality of the beauty and majesty of Christ, our great treasure and King. These people will see the holiness of God, a God who hates sin, whose righteous wrath and judgment will be poured out on sinful mankind. Our eyes will, are, are, are also open to our own wretched sinfulness and our inability to be right with God, our inability to please God on any level and understanding that we deserve the full measure of God's wrath and condemnation. The person who actually makes a biblical confession of faith is a person who has already reconciled these things in his heart. We see God for who he is. 
We see ourselves for who we are. And because of that, we, we make a clear and real profession of faith from every generated heart. And we say, my salvation is in the Lord whom I follow. Because of these truths, we see Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross and his death-defeating resurrection as the most beautiful unearned gift in the history of the universe, for which we are willing to fling our lives away in honor and service of him. To see Christ as anything less than immensely supreme, holy, worthy, worth any cost, is to not really see him or not really know him and to not be known by him. The scary words in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus didn't say, hey, you messed up big or um, you were saved and you once were saved. He said, I never knew you. You were never really part of my tree. You may have did some Christian service. You may have done some Christian practice. You may have lived a life of morality by the world standards. You may have made a false profession of faith. You may have done these things for years or your entire life, but your heart was never reborn into the family of God. Depart from me, you who are lawless, for I never knew you. If you want to know what belief in your heart actually looks like, we know what a confession of faith sounds like. But a true confession that's, that's actually uttered from a regenerate heart that has been justified before God, here's what that looks like. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 24, he told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Follow your heart? No. Verse 25 says, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever would lose his life for my sake will find it. Being a Christian is about giving up the illusion of control in your life. It's about surrendering to the Lordship of Christ. And we do this because our heart has been justified before God. He has opened the eyes of our heart, like Paul says in the first chapter of Ephesians. This isn't a call to earn your salvation. Listen, this is evidence that the eyes of your heart have been opened to the reality of Christ as Lord. You can accept Christ as a good man, a wise teacher, a prophet, an important historical figure, but unless you confess him as Lord from the heart, which means you have a reborn heart, that longs to please and obey God, you are damned. You are cursed. You are under the curse, the Adamic curse, the sin uh, nature that you were born into and that you have perpetuated through the entirety of your life as you've lived estranged and in rebellion to God. Jesus is here to say, I don't want some of your time. I don't want a little of your money. I want it all. I want your heart. I want to be your all in all. And those who really belong to him, see him as their all in all. Now don't, if you're new to the faith or you have a, a, a very, you know, juvenile understanding of justification and sanctification, let me urge you by saying, I'm not saying you'll live a perfect life. I'm not saying you won't struggle with sin. I'm not saying you won't be led away by your, your sinful members or that your eyes won't get caught in lust or that you won't fall into some grievous mistake or you're not still struggling to, to be conformed to the image of Christ in some place in your life. I'm saying at the very base of your heart, the the uh, the underlining goal of your life is to please God. And when you fall short, you mourn your sin and repent. And you cling to the, the rock of ages, the anchor who is Christ himself. Merely confessing and acknowledging that Jesus is Lord, hear me, it's not enough. James, the half-brother of Jesus, says even the demons do that. Listen to this, James 2, 14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? 
Can that faith save him? If a brother or a sister is poorly clothed or lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? It's also by faith itself. So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want this? Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works. And his faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way was also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, also faith apart from works is dead. This is one of the most sort of misunderstood scriptures in the Bible because people try to pit what James is saying here in the book of James with what Paul is saying in the book of Romans or many other places, especially the book of Ephesians. And they are not in conflict with each other. We are saved by faith alone. But that faith is not alone. That faith will be evidenced by the expression of our life. Faith is actually acknowledging and living according to the fact that you actually believe what you say you believe. That's the evidence of the regenerated heart. That you have, that listen, you are taking God at his word. Abraham took God at his word. When he laid the blessing, his blessed son, Isaac, the, the seed, the, the heir that would lead to the promised blessing of Christ. And he knew that God wouldn't go back on his word. So he obeyed him. Listen, that faith, that, that work didn't, didn't, didn't make him right. The fact that he trusted God did. Martin Lloyd-Jones said, in his uh, writings on the book of Romans, he said, to be saved, one must believe two truths, the apostle Paul would say, excuse me, Martin Louis Jones said, to be saved, one must believe two truths, the apostle Paul would say, you must tell Jesus is Lord, and you must believe that God raised him from the dead. True knowledge and acceptance of these realities will be evidenced by a life of obedience and service to Christ. How about in 1 Corinthians 15, 12? It says, Now if Christ proclaimed is raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And if Christ, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we of all people must be pitied most. What is he saying? He's saying, listen, the actual truth of the resurrection, the actual truth that Jesus was raised from the dead should propel our lives in a different direction. Because if it's just, listen, if we can't take God's word about this, we can't take his word about anything. If the scripture's wrong about this, and it's not just saying that this is the event that everything, listen, we can go back through the Bible and say, if God didn't keep one of his promises, he's not God. That's why Paul makes great pains to explain what Jesus or what God meant when he said Israel will be saved. He wasn't saying ethnic Israel. He said those who are part of the lineage of faith of Father Abraham. Hear me. 
When we talk about the confession of faith, it's so important to realize this. There is no such thing as a casual Christian. Listen to me, Christianity is not casual. It cannot be. We are talking about blood and death on a cross and resurrection and eternal life and eternal damnation. Listen, it's either everything or it's nothing, but it's definitely not casual. 1 Corinthians 15, 20, the end of the scripture we just read though. He said, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep for as man, for as by a man came death, by a man also has come resurrection from the dead. So he's saying, listen, if Christ didn't raise from the dead, then our whole faith is in vain. Everything that led up to it was meaningless and pointless because everything in the Old Testament points to the Messiah who would, who would take the sins. Listen, Isaiah says that, listen, it was for our transgressions that he was bruised, for our iniquities. Listen, it's by his stripes we are healed and saved into the eternal family of God. Our sins have been made white as snow. And if this isn't true, then everything before it is meaningless. This is what he's trying to explain to the Jews. He said the sin of the world came in through one man and sin was eradicated through one man. And that man is the God man. Only God could save us from God. Apart from Christ, we are doomed and utterly hopeless. Verse 10, it says, For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So it's through regeneration of the heart that we are justified before God because we have been given a new heart. We have literally been imputed or filled with Christ's righteousness. Like he transplanted it into us. When he gave us a new regenerate heart. Listen to what the, the prophet Ezekiel says in Ezekiel 36, 26. Prophetically saying, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in the statutes and to be careful to obey my rules. Legalistic works didn't save us. We can't walk out the law to be saved. What this is saying is, listen, we have been corrupt. Our hearts have been corrupted, utterly corrupted by sin. And God in, in the gospel and in salvation through regeneration has taken that old heart that heart of stone, that hard ground that the seed couldn't fall on. And he regenerated it and gave us a new heart. And it says he put his spirit within us. This is talking about the future after Christ died and resurrected. Now we have the very spirit of God living in us, leading us into all truth, giving us gifts so that we can edify the church in him who we have our, our we move and have our being. The very spirit of God, God did this for us in the gospel. Listen, the confession of the mouth is simply evidence of the true work of salvation in the heart. If someone merely confesses Christ but doesn't bear fruit, that person is not truly saved. But all who make a true confession from the heart will be saved. Here's the last three verses, starting in 11. For the scripture says, Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, who has been justified through true belief in their heart, will be saved. It's for the Jew and the Gentile. Abraham's true children are those who trust in Christ by faith for salvation. Many will confess that who will not follow, though. There will be many people who profess faith who didn't exit to the narrow path, and they think that they can have a broad road version of Christianity. Listen, Matthew 7, 21 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of the Father who is in heaven. 
On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, do we not prophesy in your name or cast out demons in your name or do many mighty works in your name? And I'll declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity or workers of lawlessness. Matthew 21, 28 says, what do you think? A man had two sons. Now listen, before I tell you this parable, this is, this is my closing. Before I tell you this parable, I want you to understand what this is about to talk about. There are many people who will make a confession, but they don't actually have the desire to follow Christ. They don't have a real regenerated heart. There's not real belief in their heart. They haven't been transformed by the gospel to see Christ as the immeasurable treasure of an abandoning their life for. And Jesus tells a parable in Matthew 21, 28 that says, What do you think? A man had two sons, and he went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But afterward, he changed his mind and went. And then he went to another son and said the same. He answered, I will go, sir. But then he didn't go. Which of the two did the will of the father? He said the first, and Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, but you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did believe him. And even when you saw it, you did not afterward change your minds and believe him. Listen, John the forerunner was preaching the message as the final prophet the final prophet in a string of prophets that said, repent, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And they didn't believe him. And Jesus says, even when I showed up, you didn't believe the message of John. It's the message of the prophets. It's the message of the fathers and the patriarchs. This is the word of the Lord. Today, I propose to you, repent and believe the gospel and be saved. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Just like in the story of the parable, it's not the profession of your mouth, it's what actually gets produced by it. One rejected him. I rejected Christ early in my life, but at some point I became aware of who he was. And now I'm a, a worker in the vineyard. All who make a true profession of faith will bear the fruit of repentance, a changed heart that will produce a changed life. A gospel for those who acknowledge their spiritual poverty, mourn their sin, meekly trust in Christ alone by faith. These will hunger and thirst to be right with God and God promises they will be satisfied. There is no distinction between Jew or Gentile, male or female, rich, poor, educated, simple, drug addict, prostitute, middle class, upper class, African, American, white, black, Chinese. It don't matter. There is only two groups of people, those who are ejecting God into eternal condemnation and those who from the heart call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. There's nobody too far from God that he won't accept and transform. And there's nobody too good in this life that don't desperately need him. Him. The scripture says in verse 11, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. There's no distinction between Jew and Greek for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Thank you, Jesus. God, we thank you for the great and glorious salvation that you bled and died to give to us. Lord, let us realize that Christianity is not casual. Jesus is not a, a box we check off. Lord, he is our, our all-consuming treasure. Or he is nothing. He is either Lord of all or he is nothing. Nothing but the judge who will judge us one day. Lord, I pray that even in this moment, that Lord, you are, you are making hearts tender for the seed to fall, God. Lord, for those of us who are in Christ, that we would be increasingly grateful for the gift of the gospel, the fact that we didn't deserve it, we couldn't earn it, but you gave it so freely. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. 
Lord, let that ring out from the mountaintops. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.